to start. So, yes. Good evening. Thank you very much for joining us. This is the, the 10th in our series, uh, our webinar series, Hand in Hand with Ukraine. And this evening, we're going to focus on uh, infection with a particular focus on uh, necrotizing uh, uh, fasciitis, its diagnosis and management. Um, we uh, have uh, two European, two, two speakers tonight. So Christian Dumontier, formerly of the Institut de la Main in Paris, uh, now working uh, in, uh, uh, I think it's Gu uh, Guadeloupe, um, uh, for his second visit to the webinar series uh, on a general in introduction to managing infection. Um, and then uh, Dean Boyce from Swansea is going to talk to us about uh, necrotizing fasciitis. He is the president-elect of the British Society for Surgery uh, of the Hand and is most welcome. And then uh, Professor uh, Trutiak is going to present uh, some cases uh, uh, of necrotizing fasciitis uh, related to the, to the conflict. Uh, so thank you very much for joining us. Andre, do you want to say a few words? Yeah. Доброго вечора, шановні колеги. Сьогодні десятий наш вебінар з сумісно, який проводиться за ініціативи Федерації Європейських Асоціацій Хірургів Кісті Феш та Британського Товариства Хірургії Кісті БССХ. Сьогодні ми розглянемо питання інфекції кісті і верхньої кінцівки, і, зокрема, окремою лекцією розглянемо питання з приводу некротизуючого фаситу, дуже важкої, дуже складної інфекції, яка вимагає радикальних, рішучих і невідкладних дій. Крістіан Дюментієр представить сьогодні лекцію з інфекції кісті і верхньої кінцівки, і Дін Боїс представить лекцію з некротизуючого фаситу, Після чого е, будуть питання і відповіді. Закликаю вас задавати свої питання. Можете користати, скористатися чатом, можете скористатися кнопкою Q&A. І після е, питань та відповідей професор Трутяк е, зі Львова представить нам декілька своїх випадків е, е, лікування некротизуючого фаситу після е, бойових травм, які виникли внаслідок бойової травм. Тож, закликаю вас бути активними, задавати запитання. Також, в зв'язку з тим, що проводиться підготовка до EFSH, конгресу в Лондоні на наступний четвер, і через четвер, в зв'язку з тим, що буде, власне, безпосередньо сам конгрес, е вебінарів не буде. Ми поки що думаємо з приводу можливості його проведення після е конгресу, навіть не стільки можливості, скільки теми, на, яку, о, на які варто е приділити увагу. Отже, дякую і знову ж таки закликаю бути активним. Thanks, uh, and I think, uh, Christian, you can start. The floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for inviting me. Um, I'd like to, to share with you some uh, reflection about an infection and the way you, we can uh, improve our management. Uh, this is a talk uh, we've met with my colleague, uh, Sylvie Carmes, and I'm living in uh, Guadeloupe, as already mentioned, which is a small tropical island. Uh, And infections are frequent. And so, because they are frequent, there's frequent complications. And this is something very important. We have to avoid complication of infection. Infection are quite low regarding the frequency of minor injury of the hand during the day, but most of them are caused by direct trauma. And so, so some injuries of the, within the day will cause some infection and they will uh, mostly uh, involve males around the 40s. People with, will last few days before they will search for, for treatment, 
because at the beginning, it's not uh, so a problem, uh, the infection. So we will see, this topic is in two parts. First is how to manage an infection. And the second is about some infection of the hand, not including necrotizing physitis. For example, if we think about the pathophysiology of the infection, there are four stages. First is the inoculation, the entry of the bacteria into the, the body. That goes to some inflammation that may end up with spontaneous healing or go to abscess. And the abscess can be either cured and go to healing or go to the complication stage. It is said in some textbooks that it can occur in 5% of all cases. But in our series in Guadeloupe, it was about one patient out of three that came at an advanced stage where the infection has already increased or diffused into the finger or the hand. So this is something not unusual to see the patient at the stage of an advanced uh, infection. What can we do at the inoculation stage? Well, we can do nothing, we're not here. Uh, the patient can wash his hands, can do some skin disinfection, and that's all that can be done. At that stage, there is no place for any antibiotics because any, any trauma are frequent, and infection are rare, so do not use antibiotics. That would be very expensive. That would increase the antibiotic resistance, and it will uh, give some problem with uh, patients that are allergic and it's about 5% of the population. The second stage is the inflammation stage. Then you have local inflammatory signs, redness, swelling, and pain. And the pain will sometime will be less severe at night at the inflammation stage, which is a very important clinical sign. This stage can be managed non-operatively. This is the only one that can be managed non-operatively. And the management is hand elevation to limit swelling and edema, rest, resting of the hand to uh, avoid the diffusion of the germs, some dressing soak with antiseptics like exomidine, dakin, alcohol, or whatever you want. You can use antibiotics, of course, at that stage. There will be they can be very helpful. I will say that in my practice, I do not use antibiotics at that stage, but this is very logical to use it. I prefer to rely on what is very important, even if you use antibiotics, is repeated evaluation. At that stage, it's sometimes very difficult to be sure that you're not at the abscess stage. So follow the patient very carefully if you have any doubt, then proceed to surgery if you want to avoid complication by arriving too late. So the medical treatment is a close survey of the patient. He should improve spontaneously with some medical advices, but if not, then he should proceed to surgery. Because the abscess stage will follow the inflammation stage if the uh, bacteria, uh, I would say, will uh, uh, take um, preeminence to the uh, defense of the host. Then the pain is permanent. It's usually very intense. It can increase at night. That's a very important clinical sign. At the inflammation stage, it decreases. At the abscess stage, it increases. Sometimes the pus is visible. You may have some extension of the infection to the uh, uh, the lymphangiate, the, the lymphatic system, or even to the ganglia of the uh, axillary or the epitropia uh, part. And you can have general signs, including fever or uh, biologic uh, perturbated tests. But in hand infection, usually blood tests are totally useless. What to do? Well, make an X ray. You can be already at a stage, an advanced stage, with some bone infection, some bone involvement, something, or a foreign body you were not aware of. And then proceed to the OR. Nothing new, nothing new since 
centuries. The first night we saw sleeping is an indication to surgery, was saying Canaveral in the early 20th century. And years before, it was said in Latin, the famous uh, international language that nobody can speak anymore, ubis pus, ibi evacuat, if there is pus, then you have to evacuate it. Nothing new. If you are of an abscess, there's no place for anything but surgery. Surgery is a solution. I'm not sure you can into, listen to me. You, you can excise, you must excise the entry wound and excise all the infected tissue, all the dead tissue. You should do a large gibberin. You take a sample from a theological evaluation, you do a lavage, and you do not close wound. You leave it open. And at the end of the procedure, then you can use antibiotics if you want. And then you must follow the patient very, very carefully. Lavage is with serum. You do not need any antiseptic. It does not work more or better. Usually when it has been tested, it works less. You don't need hyperpressure. You don't need a car chair. Just lavage with a syringe. But you need a lot of volume, a lot of water. Dilution is a solution to pollution was stated by the American Society. And in my hand unit in Paris, when I was a student, there was this uh, picture of Ambroise Paré, which is, uh, was said to be the king of surgeons, the surgeon of kings, because it has been the surgeon of three French kings. And he, he was saying that he has been using water, purely water, during war injuries, and he had good sexes because he cleaned the wood. Nothing new since five centuries ago. Do not close wounds. I know it could be very Im impressive. This patient has bone exposed and cartilage as well. But remember that the best antibiotic is oxygen, which is very detrimental to all germs not only the anaerobic, to all germs. If you close, then germ persistent germ will multiply themselves and you will have an extension of, of the infection. And I do not recommend to use drains. Remember, drains are just non-vascularized dead bodies that you place inside an infected tissues. So there's, the good indication is excision, lavage, debris, and then the net, I would say spontaneous healing will, will occur. If you close anything, you will have trouble. Well, you can use antibiotics, but remember, uh, as you can see, I'm not a, a, a favor, in favor of antibiotics for simple end infection. Remember that antibiotic cannot get access to uh, abscess because of the collagenic uh, wall that prevents the, the perfusion. Second, there is no blood into the uh, abscess. So the only way for antibiotics and other cells to get into the abscess is through what is called permeation, which is uh, some diffusion due to the difference of uh, uh, concentration. So the amount of antibiotics into an abscess is not very high, and more of, the, more of that, into an abscess, usually bacteria are in a non-very active stage and they are less sensitive to antibiotics. So you can use them. It's not the fault, of course. But remember, this is not the treatment of infection. The treatment is surgery. The knife is a solution. Antibiotics is just an adjunct. And it has been already published in all series of 125 patients, 90% were treated without anti um, antibiotics, even if there were osteitis or osteoarthritis, and they did well. In a series from French hospital, 45 out of 46 Whitlers were cured without post-op antibiotics. In a series of uh, drug addict patients in Los Angeles, uh, almost 100% of infection with staph patients, more than 200 patients were cured 
and they were given inappropriate antibiotics. And in children, there was no difference. So there's many publications saying that antibiotics can help, but they are not the treatment of infection. The treatment of an abscess is a surgical blade. That's, that's very important. And the second part, and then the last part is also the follow-up. You have to see the patient very early to be sure that you've been efficient. You have to ask him to, to wash his hands under the water. You do not need any sterile thing or whatever it is, just soap and, and water and that's okay. And then follow the patient every two days or something like that. And as far as it is possible, start early rehabilitation to avoid any complications. This, these are the principles, there's the most important principle for the treatment of an infection. If you see the patient at the stage of the complication, it's because the infection has extended into closed space like joint or sheath or into the anatomical spaces of uh, diffusion that has been described already by Canada a long time ago. He was injected plaster into the dam. Well, why do pre patients present with complications? Well, the most important is that they present late. If they came late, if they come late, then they probably will have some complication. And they come late because they have seen a precision who start an inadequate treatment. He was giving non-steroid anti-inflammatory drugs that multiply by three to 15 the rate of uh, fascist necrotizing, for example. He has been given antibiotics and it was not indicated because it was at the abscess stage. And then it will diminish the clinic, but do not um, eliminate the diffusion of the infection. Or it was inadequately treated with wound closure and then there are, there are reinfection. While some patients probably are more prone to infection than others, uh, there are some controversies about the immune deficient patient. Um, in some papers, diabetic patients uh, have an increased risk of getting infected. It was not the case in all series, for example, but like in uh, many series, if they are not more infected, they are more difficult to treat at least. So immune deficient patients are uh, a population at risk because they do more often complication or because they get more often infection. It's not really clear. Well, it could be also due to the germs. We'll uh, talk about that, that uh, next slide. Uh, remember, it's rare today for an infection, I'm not talking about necrotizing, to die, but it has been published recently, once again, and before the antibiotics are rea, it was 3% for disease of sheet infection and 7% for hand abscesses. So it's not a, a simple uh, disease. And for example, this poor patient is a poor guy. He's only 23 years old. He had an infection of the pulp. He's a felon. And he was treated with antibiotics and uh, non-steroid antibiotic drugs. And it ended up with an amputation of the thumb which is clearly unacceptable, at least at the moment. What were the complications we've seen, for example, by secondary osteoarthritis, the flexible sheet uh, infection by diffusion, septic arthritis, or extension of the infection to the digit, for example, or to the hand, or a necrosis of the soft tissues. Um, Regarding the germs, uh, in all series, in all series, sorry, in all series, Staphylococcus aureus is the most, most, most frequent germ. It's repre it represents between 30 to 80% of all published series. So in hand infection, Staphylococcus aureus is a problem, but at the same time, in all series, for example, if you get infection with Staphylococcus aureus, then you have less chance to have a complication, probably because it's a very um, active bacteria. And so clinical signs are very, very uh, active, very, um, uh, I could say that in English, I'm sorry, uh, very important. So patient present not too late. 
Streptococci is not a major issue, but some, pay, some germs can be uh, necrotic, so we have to take care of those patients. And some Graham strains, well, it seems that it's not a major influence, but um, my personal belief is some Gram-negative uh, bacteria like Terasama sensens, for example, are probably more prone to complication. And then the second part, because I don't want to be too long, it's some example of an infection that managed. Well, for example, occurring well infections, which are the most frequent. Well, diagnostic is very easy. It's Staphylococcus aureus. It's almost all the cases. And you can do a drainage without, um, I'm close because I cannot see. You can do a drainage without anesthesia. For example, you just, uh, put a blade and then you press on the nail, just, just press on the nail, and then you will be able to evacuate the pus without anesthesia. If needed, of course, you'll do excision under local anesthesia and digital tourniquets. Uh, here, here are some examples of the diffusion of the infection from a peronychia. I can go to the dorsum of the finger under the nail plate, or into the pulp, and it goes through the famous interphalangeal ligament, which was described by Flint, and the pus can go into the, the pulp from the pronychium. So once you go to the OR, just check the, the pulp to be sure there's no infection inside. Pulp infections are less frequent, but they are very dangerous because the clinical diagnosis is more difficult. Uh, the pus sometimes is not visible and the only clinical sign you can have is a very painful, tense uh, pulp. It's also most often Staphylococcus aureus, uh, but due to the hyperpressure into the pulp, which is uh, not a closed sac, as was saying Canaver, but something like a closed sac, uh, the pressure will push the bacteria into the bone, and bone involvement is quite early in that. Uh, uh, type of infection. Uh, there is a lot of discussion about the incision. I would suggest to go directly onto the pulse. So I go with a direct incision. I do not do uh, lateral incision, whatever it is, stick, uh, fish mouth incision, at all. I think it's too more detrimental. Just go directly to the pulse, evacuate the pulse, excise the bone if needed, and leave it open, and it will heal very easily. Here are some examples of an extension of a pulp infection that went on to the to the ball, to the hand. Sorry, you see that everything is destroyed. You just remove the bone without uh, with just some simple forces. If you got infection in the finger, what it, it is dorsal or uh, volar. The principle is the same. Do a large excision. In dorsal uh, infection, it means that you have to excite the tendon, the extended tendon, quite frequently. This is an example. And you see at the end that the bone is visible because you have excised. We had to excise every dead tissue. And uh, beware of the extension of the incision in the soft tissue, uh, especially on the volar side. And as already mentioned, leave it open. This is an example of an infection, but this is uh, an extension, very superficial, which is a flictinal tape. So uh, it's very easy to treat. You, you don't even need uh, anesthesia. On the volar side, the infection can go along the flexor sheet up to the hand or along the pedicle. So sometimes you have uh, infected tissue all around the pedicle. So beware when you try to curate uh, the, the infection, not to curate the nerves or the arteries. And you see the, the extension of the incision to get rid of all infected tissues. That's very important. And we're going more proximal into the anatomical spaces of the hand that has been uh, described a long, long time ago by Canaveral first. There are three cleanly delineated uh, space 
uh, the thin air space, the mid polar space, and the hypotina at the end. Uh, one of the forearm, which is space of parona, and uh, the schist, the flexor tendon schist, uh, ulnar and radial uh, at the end. And there are poorly delimited spaces, which are the web spaces and the dorsal part of the, of the hand. Regarding the web space, the diagnosis is clinical because you see the patient with some finger abduction. There is also a dorsal edema, but there is a volar infection. It starts usually volar and it goes dorsal, passing through the web. And if you want to treat this patient, then you have to do two incisions, one dorsal, one volar, and you should not cross the web space. So take care with the volar incision because the artery divides very distal. If we go to the flexor sheath infection, uh, what is important is it's, uh, to make the diagnosis, which is a clinical diagnosis. Remember that the bacteriology is most often Staphylococcus aureus, and it's mostly, mostly due to penetrating injuries. It's rarely due to diffusion or as a postoperative complication. And the treatment will be made according to the classification of mission that we'll show you. First, some words about the flex and tendon sheet. There's many variations, but basically the sheath of the second, middle, and fourth finger usually stop at the MP level. In less than 5% of cases, it goes up to the ball. The flexor sheath of the uh, thumb communicate with the radial sheet in 100% of the cases. So if you got a flexor sheet infection of the thumb, the proximal incision to do the lavage is at the level of the wrist. There is no other way to do a complete lavage. That's very, very important. Usually, the sheath of the little finger communicate with the honor sheath of the carpal tunnel in, I'd say, probably a half of the case. But there is a paper, a very good paper from Philips, that, that shown that it communicates probably in less than 30% of the case. And he has shown in his paper that basically half will end at the level of the MP. Uh, the, is the proximal cul de sac like the other long fingers. About a third will continue with the honor sheath, so only a third. And some will even end up uh, quite distal. That means that for the little finger, you have to do an inspection at the MP level, then at the wrist level to be sure that you're not missing an extension of the infection into the hand. Both sheets, the radial and the ulnar, communicate in about half to 80% of patients, which are the, uh, the cause for uh, the infection going from the thumb to the little finger or vice versa, for example. And in many patients, the ulnar sheet communicate with the mid pulpar space. So mid pulpar infection can go up proximal to the mid, to the carpal tunnel, or even to the space of corona, and the same and the opposite is also possible. The diagnosis is clinical. Carnival has described three and then four cardinal signs, global finger swelling, pain with finger extension, which is the most sensitive, and a finger which is on slight flexion. And the pain at the proximal cul-de-sac, which is the most specific, it means that the pain is at the level of the MP, basically for the long fingers, but at the level of the wrist for the thumb and quite frequently for the little finger. Beware of that. There are signs of gravity, and this is very important because if there's no signs of gravity as presented by Zoida Leina and a group from Korea. Well, basically, you can save the finger and you can get some 80% uh, of the total active motion. But as far as you have diffusion uh, into the finger, then you raise to 8% amputation rates. And if you go to ischemia, 
then it's 60% amputation rate. So if you come too late for flexor sheet infection, then you can have a lot of problem or basically the patient will end up with a lot of problem with complication and sometimes amputation. What are the mutual stage? Uh, Paul Michel was a French uh, hand surgeon uh, in the 70s. Well, stage one, there is some clear liquid, uh, but it's not pus. There's some distension, there's a liquid into the sheet. In stage two, the pus is locked, there is pus into the sheet, and there's some sign of IT, which can be either localized, which is stage 2A, or diffuse along the finger, which is stage 2B. And in stage 3, the tendon is infected, is getting necrotic, and there is no way to save it. You have to excise the tendons of the finger. So in stage one, you excise the entry portal, you take biological samples. Even if I don't use antibiotics, I need to know the germs in case of. You do an incision in the proximal cul-de-sac, which is at the finger or at the wrist, and you do a proximal distal lavage with saline. You do not need anything else. Leave the incision open and control the patient early and start rehabilitation as far as early as it is possible. Oh, this is a uh, liquid, you can see. Okay, you know that already. In stage two, same principle, you excise the entry portal, you take samples, but you extend the incision with a Brunner type incision to do a sign of ectomy, either localized if it's a local sign of itis, or all along the finger if it's a more severe case, and you try to protect the analopoly at least A2 and A4. Leave the incision open. Do not try to close, you will have trouble. Control day two, day four, and as far as possible, as early as possible, sorry, try to start rehabilitation. Regarding the other dead spaces of the hand, the hypotenar space is, well, infection at that level are very rare. Uh, because there is no possible expansion of this infection, usually this is a localized pain and swelling, and there is no swelling on the dorsum of the hand. Uh, although, the, uh, but the swelling for the other infection, not for this one. This is only a clinical sign. The mid pulmonary uh, uh, space um, in between, basically the oblique fascia, the level of third metacarpal, and the the hypotenar uh, space. In that infection, you have a dorsal swelling and also pulmonary swelling and pain. Usually, you will see the patient with a bump. The the you lost the concavity of the hand uh, that shows that there's something inside. Uh, it's very tense, it's very painful, but it's very rare to see the pulse. So you have to be aware of this type of infection uh, to, to get there. It's difficult uh, to drain the hand because of its rich anatomy, there is no good incision. The incision is the one you need. So make all the possible incision you need, do it large to control the pedicles. And this is an example. You see we extend the incision and there was some necrosis on the finger. We went back to surgery and we extend and we leave everything open. And this is the only way to get rid of infection. On the other radial side, you have the general space, which is limited by the basically the uh, first web and the oblique fascia. Uh, like the web, like any web space, two incisions are needed. You do not cross the uh, the web. That's very important. But beware, at the palm, the infection is going very deep in front of the third metacarpal. So you have to go there with your scissors your curette to be sure that you not, do not leave anything. And of course, you leave it open. And the last uh, space is the proximal space, uh, the space of Parona. Usually, infection of the space of Parona are secondary to infection of the radial flexor sheet or the uh, carpal tunnel. And the infection is getting, getting into the, the forearm uh, to be drained. 
As a conclusion, and I would like to thank the British and Fair Society for giving me the opportunity to, to give that talk, be very aggressive. Remember that bacteria multiply themselves within half an hour. During my talk, we have double of population of bacteria. The second is a dead tissue or an infected tissue cannot heal. Do not hesitate to excise every dead tissue. If you leave a dead tissue, you leave something that will serve an, as a nutriment for the bacteria and that cannot be uh, accessed by even by either antibiotics or polynuclear or whatever it is. So dead tissues cannot heal. And no one will be, uh, will be um, telling you that you are too aggressive, but if too shy or if you not removing enough tissue, then you will have uh, severe complications. The patient will have severe complications. Thank you very much for listening to me. And I will stop the, I'm trying to find my mouse to stop the portage. It should be there. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, okay. I think we may have some questions in Ukrainian. Yeah, we have two questions. Uh, first one, uh, uh, our colleague is asking about, do you use pulsolite lavage uh, in, if you have a big, uh, bigger wounds? Excuse me, I didn't get all the things regarding the lavage. If I use pulse lavage, yes. Uh, no, no, no. Uh, because I don't have one, so I don't want to buy one just for the few indications. And the idea behind that is, if you use pulse lavage, you put pressure and you push the germs mm. out of the of the wound. It has been published that the more pressure you give. The, the, the longer or the, the, the fast, the far you push the germs. So it's, it, it is no more recommended even for example, uh, uh, open uh, leg fracture. So uh, lavage, yes, but not hyperpressure. I, I think there's reasonable, I think there's strong evidence from the British military experience that it's actually detrimental. It causes additional tissue death uh, and just simple washing uh, with a syringe, uh, or maybe with a, just a gravity feed drip set is the answer, not pulse lavage. Yeah, and the vol volume is matter. Volume matters. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, also we have uh, one interesting question about, uh, for you, Christian, uh, do you have any experience of uh, infected wounds in the patient with Dupuytren disease? No, probably had some, but basically, if you do Dupuytren disease, I I like very much the Macash, which is the open wound technique, and even if the flexor seat is open, I have not seen a flexor seat infection. So, leaving open a wound is no not a real problem. I'm not afraid of that. I know it's impressive, uh, but uh, well, oxygen is a major antibiotic we, we we have. Thanks. Maybe, maybe, maybe our English colleagues have more experience with deep terms because they have more cases than I. Jonathan, Dean, maybe you have some. Dean? I'm not English, Christian. I'm, I'm Welsh, but I'll answer if that's okay. <laughs> um, I'm, yeah, right. I'm, Sorry I'm, about that. <laughs> it's okay. I've, I've, I've not seen a huge. Uh, incidence of uh, of infection in Dupuytren disease. That's, I mean, I've seen sort of graft failure and, and perhaps wound breakdown, but not infection. I, th I think um, I'd see a fair number of superficial infections, but normally if you take the stitches out, I'd normally take the stitches out, take a swab, um, and I tend to start uh, antibiotics early and there isn't much that doesn't respond to one week's antibiotics. It, it's, it's rare that you have, uh, I mean, the only time I can recall a Jupiterans that needed uh, to go back to theatre is if there's been a graft failure. Thank you very much. So I don't think we have any more questions for now. 
And uh, I think Dean can go. Here comes a horror movie. <laughs> yeah. Can you can you see? Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, that's perfect. Well done. I mean, I, may, I could I could probably stop after one sentence, and that's just to repeat what Christian said: is that if there's infected tissue, uh, sp uh, particularly necrotizing infections, then uh, then it needs to be excised. And if there's an infected tissue, uh, then it needs to be excised. And then I could probably go home, but I'll carry on anyway. So necrotizing fast is often uh, sensationalized in the media, uh, but this concern is well founded. And I think anyone who's treated this condition will know how you're hit by the, the sudden brutality of this condition. These are the infections I'm talking about, but just look at the mortality rate. It's more dangerous than any other uh, condition that we treat as surgeons. It's still a relatively rare infection. Uh, it's got a male predominance and occurs where bacteria are able to infect areas where they're not normally found. Um, anyone can get it, uh, but it's certainly, uh, it's certainly helped by immune compromised. Um, other risk factors, uh, particularly for type two, a varicella infection, particularly in children, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, as, as Christian mentioned, uh, are thought to be uh, thought to be a risk factor due to suppression of neutrophil function. Uh, and it can present in very healthy individuals with a history of only very minor trauma. And despite advances in surgical care, the incidence and death rate from necrotis and fasciitis, even in the non-conflict uh, setting, is increasing. And one of the main reasons for this, I think, is delayed diagnosis. Uh, in medical school, uh, we're taught common things are common. Cellulitis is common, but necrotizing fasciitis is not. Um, and I think necrotizing fasciitis can also spread to a wide variety of specialties, from medicine to ENT to surgery to orthopedics and so on. So what limited experience there is uh, may be diluted. But lastly, and I think this is quite important, I think doctors may be scared of um, making the diagnosis because if you, if you do make that call, then you're going to have to do some pretty horrible surgery to the patient to try and treat them. Oh, I think I've just... Okay, there we go. So it's been known for decades that delayed diagnosis costs lives. So you can see on this graph, if you debride and diagnose at an early stage, you've got a really high chance of saving the patient. If you don't, then that's got quite a profound effect on mortality. And why are these infections so deadly? Well, I think you just have to look at live microscopy of these bacteria multiplying uh, to understand why these infections can spread so quickly. Unlike more usual infections, uh, which have a vertical direction of spread limited laterally by fascia, the spread of these organisms is no more limited by fascia. They spread on it and superficial to it, and they secrete enzymes to help them do it. And as they do so, they cause thrombosis, ischemia, and necrosis of the overlying tissues. And eventually, they spread deeply uh, and into muscle. What else causes them to be so deadly? The answer is, is of course, multifactorial. But a key factor is often the response of the immune system to the infection. Exotoxins can wreak havoc. They can cause clumps of blood cells to accumulate and cause angiothrombosis. Areas of tissue therefore become ischemic and this necrosis is a pivotal point in making these infections uh, untreatable by antibiotics and only treatable by surgical debridement. So these are the types. Type one is polymicrobial. It's about two thirds of cases. Uh, it occurs mainly in the elderly, uh, in those with underlying illnesses or injuries. Um, and it's a little bit more indolent with initial diagnosis of cellulitis sometimes. Delayed diagnosis can raise mortality, but in a recent series, the mortality of this type can be as low as 10%, but as high as 30%. Type two, however, is about a third of cases, uh, is monomicrobial and a completely different ball game, usually caused by a group A strep or sometimes a staph aureus. It occurs in all age groups without any underlying illness, and a group A strep is a formidable adversary. When streptococcal shock develops, 
mortality can be over 80%. Type three is one I've never seen in my own practice. Uh, it's characterized usually by large wounds exposed to warm seawater. We don't get much of that in Wales, but perhaps Christian may get some in Guadeloupe. Um, but it's said to be associated with military um, and large wounds exposed to warm seawater and therefore Vibrio. Again, it's got quite a high mortality rate. Type four is fungal. Um, and again, is slightly more common than we think. I think uh, it certainly duped me in the past and I'll, I'll show you an example of that. Um, and I routinely now send samples from mycology when I treat necrotizing infections. Now, as I mentioned, the type two necrotizing fasciitis is the most deadly and it can happen when there's both a defined port of entry and also when it's not. When there is a port of entry, the strep enters the deep tissues via skin breaches, uh, which may be very minor, such as insect bites, uh, varicella vesicles, uh, penetrating trauma, or even surgery. But in approximately 50% of patients uh, with group A strep uh, or myonecrosis, infection starts deep in the soft tissues without a port of entry, often at sites of non-penetrating trauma, such as a muscle strain, bruising or yeah, some blunt trauma. This lady presented to her doctor, who happened to be my brother actually, on a Monday with pain in her armpit after throwing a ball for a dog. He thought she had a muscle strain. On Wednesday morning, she presented like this in acute shock uh, and throughout that morning developed these changes in her arm. Uh, the neck fascia in her case it started in the scapular region and tracked into her arm. Uh, after an unsuccessful first debridement, after which she remained really, really sick. She had a four quarter amputation, but she still later succumbed to the sepsis. So this is really brutal disease. So the, the early features of neck fascia can mimic cellulitis, but most patients with cellulitis have hyperesthesia and pain over the area of cellulitis. In neck fascia, you may not even have cellulitis, as in this chap here, but neck, neck fascia patients usually have pain out of proportion to what you can see. And this is a really important clinical sign because it's a sign of the angiothrombosis I mentioned earlier, causing ischemia and hypoxia to the superficial nerves and causing this quite exquisite tenderness beyond the area of obvious involvement. Loss of skin turgor is another sign. In cellulitis, you get swollen, shiny skin. But in neck, neck fascia, instead of looking red and angry, the skin loses its turgor looks more sorry for itself with potentially delayed instead of brisk capillary refill. Malaise, um, myalgias, diarrhea, anorexia may also be present in the first 24 hours. And since skin manifestations are absent or can be minimal initially, the infection is often misdiagnosed as a muscle strain like the lady I showed you, or thrombophobitis, or even food poisoning because of the malaise and diarrhea. Late change changes include crepitus, but I would never look for crepitus to diagnose neck fash. Uh, crepitus only uh, occurs in about 20% of cases. And of course, blistering and skin anesthesia and necrotic areas are other uh, very late signs. As for other diagnostic aids, the l Renac score has been around for uh, more than a decade or so. It's an often quoted tool that looks at CRP, white cell count, hemoglobin, sodium, creatinine, blood glucose and tries to differentiate between cellulitis and neck fascia. But it's a really blunt tool. Uh, you can easily see how a diabetic with cellulitis, a bit of renal impairment, can easily clock up six on this scale. So personally, I would say it's, it's of limited diagnostic use. Maybe controversial, in my view, there's no, radio, no role for radiology in, in the management of necrotizing fasciitis. In my view, if you suspect necrotizing fasciitis, the patient should be taken to the theatre and not the scanner. It's a waste of valuable time. Equally, there's no indication for patient transfer. The patient should be managed at the receiving hospital and taken to theatre without delay as soon as the condition is suspected. The first thing you should do is take the appropriate bloods that I've listed here. And then you need to give uh, appropriate antibiotics, um, including a broad spectrum beta lactam. If it's a, strep, a group A strep, it'll probably respond to simple penicillin, but you always give something broad spectrum, such as mirapenem we use in the UK, uh, which will uh, attack the cell wall. 
and also clindamycin, uh, which is bactericidal and also importantly stops production of and binds to and mops up to the, effect, the effects of toxins. And clearly you should also discuss it with your microbiologist. You also need to resuscitate your patient uh, as if they're not in shock by the time you see them, they're likely to be very soon. There's a lot of debate about hyperbaric oxygen, but really the only proven effective treatment is aggressive surgical debridement as soon as practically possible. And the aim of your surgery is firstly to confirm your diagnosis and isolate the organism, secondly to find the extent of the fasciitis and thirdly to excise it. So first you have to confirm the diagnosis by an exploratory incision. You can do this on the ward or intensive care. In my view, it's better to patient, take the patient to theatre. And with, when you make your incision, you get this fluid. It's called dishwater fluid because it's supposed to look like this grey turbid colour, like dishwater. And you'll be able to separate the, the fascia from the, from the superficial tissues with, with a finger sweep. If the subcutaneous tissues are bleeding and the fascia is healthy, then you can continue to absorb Observe the patient, but you should always send a specimen of the fascia for gram stain and for culture. And if your exploratory incision is positive, how radical does your debridement need to be? Now to define this out, you need to define the extent of the disease, and you can do that by dividing it into three zones. Zone one is the area of obvious infection and skin necrosis. This zone is non-viable, heavily infected, the margin can be assessed by the finger sweep test and also looking for thrombosis and bleeding in the subdermal tissues. Zone two shows signs of early neck fash with warm, tender skin. And zone three is normal tissue. To remove the disease, you need to remove zone one and two with a three centimeter calf, if possible, of zone three. So if you look at this lady here, in my view, this probably represents zone one, and then this is zone two, and you can see zone three. You need to remove a good two to three centimeters of zone three in order to clear the disease. So this is, uh, for example, uh, could be a 42-year-old diabetic with a 48-year-old history, 48-hour history of minor trauma. Clinically, this looks like a, a necrotizing condition. An excellent incision is made, and this is what dishwater fluid looks like. With a finger sweep test, the dead fascia will quite easily separate from the tissues above it with finger pressure. And then this dead fascia is excised and sent for culture and for microscopy with a good clear margin. Now, as I mentioned before, your first debridement should be your last. You need to read completely normal tissue with a safe fire break and send a specimen of this fire break for microscopy and for culture. If the infection invades muscle, then that muscle also needs to be excised with a good margin. And if this is the case, there's a very high amputation rate. Now, then following your debridement, yeah, the area is copiously irrigated, certainly not pulse lavaged, copiously irrigated, um, and in my practice is dressed with betadine salt gauze, but then you can't really rest on your laurels. Uh, and take the patient back as 48 hours, as you do for many infections. If the patient doesn't recover quickly and you don't see the signs of sepsis improving, you may need to take the patient back to theatre within two or three hours just to reinspect what's going on and to further debride. Normally, we take the patient back to theatre within 12 to 24 hours when the results of the zone three culture will be forthcoming and the need for further debridement can be assessed. And after a few debridements, um, when you're sure the infection is cleared, a vac dressing can be applied uh, prior to uh, definitive reconstruction, uh, which usually is uh, using split skin grafts. Sometimes, of course, that's not appropriate, as in this case here with exposed tendon, which will need to be covered with a flap. In this case, with a, uh, not a very pretty flap, but an ALT flap. Now, Decision making is so difficult in these patients, uh, and I'm really looking forward to see uh, Professor Trudiak's cases um, later on to, to, to get his experience. 
it's difficult because if you deprive these patients, you know you're going to completely disfigure them, which is a difficult call, especially in a child. But if you don't deprive them, then you risk the patient's life. So I thought I'd show you a couple of cases. This is a two-year-old child with acute sepsis, an 18-hour history of spreading cellulitis in the area shown. Uh, he's had a recent varicella infection, as you can see, and he's recently been treated with non-steroidals, both of which are risk factors for neck fash. He's got an LRNX score of seven. So in theatre, I made explored incisions, one in the neck, one in the chest. The fascia was bleeding and adherent. Microscopy and gram stain showed no organisms. Now, negative microscopy doesn't rule out necrotizing fasciitis, but it does certainly offer you some reassurance. And indeed, eventually, he turned a corner systemically and made a full recovery. Second case I want to show you, this is a 13 month old child, uh, with a four day history of illness, diarrhea, vomiting, and then presented to a &E, uh, with a swollen right leg. At a high LRNX score, the pediatrician saw him initially, which arranged an MRI scan, and he was soon transferred to the pediatric intensive care unit uh, because he was so unwell. This is his MRI scan which shows gross edema of the fascia of the lower limb extending up into the buttock region and hip region. And this is what necrotizing fasciitis looks like. This is the point I got involved. This is clearly a case of necrotizing fasciitis. So we make an exploratory incision and we got dishwater fluid. And it was clearly extensive disease, extending in some multiple areas into muscle, I'm operating here with my orthopedic colleague, and it's really useful to do these with senior colleagues uh, because it helps your decision making. So this is an extremely sick child who is getting worse. Um, so after defining the extent of the disease, we made a, a horrible decision, which was to amputate the limb. This is gut wrenching surgery and your stomach turns while you're doing these operations. But within half an hour, physiologically, this child improved um, and uh, it's a terrible surgery, but this is a child a year later, and that surgery saved this child's, no, ch child's life. I have no doubt about that. Another patient, 10-year-old girl with a 24-hour history of cellulitis of the arm and systemic sepsis, uh, resistant to antibiotics. Again, uh, uh, LRNX score of six on this occasion, or seven. Uh, for some reason, again, before I saw the patient, an MRI was arranged which worryingly showed this fascial edema extending well into the axilla and the chest wall. And this is the point again that I got involved. So based on this MRI, we took her to theatre preparing for the worst uh, possible scenario, a horrible debridement, even a full quarter amputation uh, in a young, young girl. A large axial incision was made, but in incising the fascia, finger sweep test was negative, the fascia was alive and adherent. Specimen was then from my microscopy while she was on the table that was negative. So despite the MRI findings and the systemic sepsis, we took the decision, this can be difficult sometimes in an unwell child, to do nothing and not to debride. Um, and thankfully, this is how it looked uh, 24 hours or so later uh, with no obvious fasciitis. And indeed, uh, a few uh, days later, we directly closed it. So, you know, the outcomes are not always grim. Lastly, I just want to tell you about this chap. This chap was a tree surgeon who got horrible systemic sepsis following an injury at work. And no source for this sepsis could be found apart from his hand and it wasn't settling. The intensivists on ITU wanted us to amputate his hand, which we didn't particularly want to do, because when we took the dressing down, it wasn't obviously infected until we took his dressing off one day and we saw this fungus growing on his wounds, which in fact responded very well to my antimycotics. So you, you always got to remember um, fungus in these septic patients. Now, as I mentioned, this chap was a tree surgeon, and this, in fact, is a photo uh, of a tree in a park about 20 minutes from where he lived. So in summary, necrotizing fasciitis is a horrible disease uh, and has got a high mortality. Early diagnosis can be curative and delayed debridement can be fatal. Apart from bloods, in my view, the only investigation of worth is an urgent exploratory incision and biopsy of the fascia. Infective skin and muscle is excised in a zonal manner with a safe fire break and amputation performed if necessary. 
and your first debridement needs to be your last. Thank you very much indeed for inviting me uh, this evening. It's been a great privilege to meet, to, 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 to talk and to hear the experience of Christian. And I'm really looking forward to hearing the experience of um, Professor Truchak and his, uh, and his cases that he's, uh, he's experienced over the last month or so. Well done, Dean. Lovely talk. Just a couple of questions before we move on uh, to uh, Professor Tritiak's talk. Firstly, uh, is do you always need to excise skin if you explore early? Can't you excise the fascia and preserve skin if it's viable? I think you'd be a very brave man to do that, Rajiv. Um, certainly, in, uh, in my in my experience, I've never done that. Uh, I've never found a case that's been uh, explored early enough. And, you know, we, we're quite aggressive in, in our debridement uh, and exploratory incisions. Um, so, yeah, I've never come across it. I wouldn't, I wouldn't leave the skin. If the skin was non-adherent to the fascia, I would certainly take the skin. I think the, the, the danger is if, if you're timid, the patients die, don't they? Mm. Basically. Um, the second one is... Um, uh, is there any, have you had any experience of um, hypochlorous acid rather than uh, washout for neck fash? None at all, no. I've, I've always treated it very simply uh, with biopsy and excision of, of infected disease. I haven't used, I've never used anything else. Right, I think we have 25 minutes left. Uh, so I think we can... Uh, come back to um uh Giles becker has commented that tend to send an interoperative frozen section it sounds as if you send interoperative microbiology if you're not sure but uh we'll, we'll move on to professor tritiak's talks and can come back to a few more questions at the end if we have time yeah so professor please unmute yourself Okay, dear colleague, thank you very much for invitation to take part in this webinar. Uh, a lot of time to prepare a full presentation because I present some cases from of uh, our experience to treatment uh, necrotizes infections. But the first, I am very thankful for uh, Christian and Dean for excellent presentation. And next, thankful for Dean because uh, your presentation is uh, uh, very, very same for my opinion. Okay. Thank you very much. Next one. I have share a screen. Is okay? Yeah. Yes, it's okay. Uh, the aim of my presentations is acute uh, um, for a young surgeon, for young physician to the very, very severe complications, wound complication, um, necrotizing fastidies, uh, necrotizing infections. Okay, uh, next I speak in Ukrainian and uh, dear Andrei, uh, please translate some thesis uh, my presentation, okay? Okay, no problem. Uh, Дорогі молоді, молоді колеги, мені би хотілося заострити вашу увагу власне на діагноз важкого ускладнення, яким є некритизуюча інфекція. Сам трасліт? Ну, so dear young colleagues, I want to uh, uh, ask you to uh, look at some uh, complications that can be uh, after uh, necrotizing infection. Yes. 
перше, перше спостереження серед такої пліади вибрав той найбільш яскраві. Це молодий чоловік, який отримав вогнепальне поранення, лікувався в одному із цивільних закладів, там, де, мабуть, хірургії було мало. Ось на восьмий день після вогнепального поранення ми зустрілися з такою картиною нижньої кінцівки і значною інтоксикацією у цього пацієнта. The young man uh, that has a gunshot injury of his uh, right uh, leg, uh, he was treated in one of the civilian hospital uh, at, at the eight day of, uh, after the gunshot injury, uh, we faced uh, such a clinical uh, picture and the uh, mass intoxication. Після короткочасної інтенсивної терапії була виконана радикальна фастіо- і міотомія з некриптомією, з видаленням нежиттєздатних тканин і розкриттям всіх просторів на гомілці і на стегні. After a short time uh, IV therapy, a uh, patient uh, was taken to the OR and uh, radical fasciectomy and necrectomy uh, are applied to this patient. Проте бажаного результату ми не отримали. But we don't achieve the great results, so. І для того, щоб зберегти життя, Керуючися Лімп Бефо Лайф, ми виконали високу ампутацію стигна. Це зберегло життя йому і дозволило визволити. В подальшому все було сформовано високе. Uh, so, but as we don't achieve uh, the great result after the uh, radical fasciectomy and necrectomy. Uh, we take it, he, him to OR once again and make the higher level uh, uh, hip amputation to save his life uh, because uh, life is more important than limb. Uh, after a few uh, days, the uh, stump was uh, formed. Yes. Наступне, наступне е, спостереження, наступне, досить тяжке, досить важке, тому що даний молодий чоловік тривалий час знаходився під завалами, і у нього розвився компартний синдром, а на фоні компартного синдрому поширена близьковична некритизуюча інфекція, некритозуючий фастіїт і некритозуючий міозіт із потужною інтоксикацією, із поліорганною недостатністю. І незважаючи на можливі хірургічні втручання і інтенсивну терапію, включаючи призмафлекс, протягом тижня боролися за його життя, але не вдалося його врятувати. The next case is a young man uh, that was trapped under the uh, ruins. Uh, he has a severe crash syndrome, compartment syndrome, and uh, a necrotizing infection, necrotizing fasciitis, and necrotizing myositis. Uh, uh, we tried to save his life for for about one week, but he has a uh, polyorganic uh, insufficiency and uh, he uh, very early has a polyorganic failure. So uh, even uh, all our surgical methods and uh, our therapy uh, wouldn't don't give a great result and uh, unfortunately the patient died. На даній прозірці ви бачите стан тільки нижньої кінцівки. Хочу сказати, що процес поширювався і на черевну стінку, і на заочерений простір, і на грудну стінку. 
Продолжаючи на те, що... In this okay. slide you can see uh, the photos of his uh, leg, but the process are uh, going to his abdomen, uh, to his intestine and uh, uh, chest wall. Причиною смерті цього пацієнта був втрачений час, несучасна допомога в зв'язку із пізною доставкою його лікувальний заклад. Не могли and, його визволити із під завалу. And the main reason uh, of the death of this patient was uh, that we lost time while we tried to receive him from the ruins. Наступне спостереження некротичного е, целюліту. Молодий чоловік також поступив до нас в клініку, в клініку із е, симптоматикою місцевою досить і досить такою бідною, скутною. Проте у нього наростала інтоксикація організму. The next case is a, a young male with a necrotizing cellulitis. He applied to our hospital with a uh, uh, very uh, poor clinical uh, picture, but he has uh, mass uh, intoxication. Це спонукало до нас нас до негайної хірургічного негайного хірургічного втручання, котре полягало в некректомії підшкірної клітковини і підшкірна фаси, якщо видно мою стрілку, я його показую тут. Дебрідмент багаторазове рідинне антисептиками промивання, подальшому терапія негативним тиском, вактерапія, вигляд рани через 4 дні, що дозволило нам виконати комбіновану пластику, закрити рану з добрим результатом. Uh... The mass intoxication, uh give us uh, the sign that we should take it, him to OR. We make a mass debridement with uh, uh, resection of all of uh, necrotizing uh, uh, cellulite uh, and uh, fascia and some uh, fat. Uh, after um, the debridement, uh, we uh, applied the negative pressure wound therapy. Uh, for four days and the, the uh, limb uh, and the picture uh, of the uh, limb after the four days of uh, VAC therapy. Uh, and uh, as the wound is clear and uh, good, we uh, make uh, some uh, grafting and uh, close the wound. Наступне спостереження, на нашу думку, є таке ексклюзивне. Цей молодий військовий поступив до нас із іншої області, в тяжкому стані, з вираженою інтоксикацією, з поліорганною недостатністю і з локальним статусом, який ви бачите на прозірці, на слайді. The next case is very interesting one because this is the young uh, soldier that applied to our hospital from other region of Ukraine. We have such a clinical picture, uh, polyorganic uh, insufficiency, uh, organic failure and uh, uh, mass intoxication. Первинна була травма плечового суглобу і надпліччя із дислокацією суглоба, ну і з невеликими ушкодженнями по криві. Uh, he has a trauma of his shoulder, uh, shoulder joint with uh, shoulder dislocation uh, and uh, a little uh, wounds uh, on the skin. Інтенсивна короткочасна терапія для стабілізації життєвої функції цього пацієнта і потім радикальне хірургічне втручання, радикальний дебрідмент з висеченням підшкірної клітковини фасції на грудній стінці 
з видаленням великого грудного м'яза, залишився малий грудний м'яз, з видаленням клітковини аксилярної ділянки, клітковини під і надключичної ділянки, з частковим видаленням короткої голівки біцепса і видаленням м'яза коракобрахіаліс, і з розтинами на передпліччі, з розтинами на черевній стінці. After the short IV intensive therapy, we take him to the OR and make the mass debridement with the excision of all necrotic fascia, excision of pectoralis major, part of the short head of the biceps, and part of deltoid muscle, coracobrachialis muscles, and also subclavian and supraclavicular fat spaces. He has also the incisions to decompress and debride his forearm and abdomen wall. We полностью згідним з вами дін бо лікувальна тактика терапії була дуже подібною на те, котре ви представили на, своєму, на своїй презентації. Антибіотикотерапія, включаючи кліндоміцин і групу меронемів, інтенсивна дискусійна терапія і дуже-дуже було ефективним гіперберична оксигенація. Uh, we uh, fully agreed with you, Dean, about uh, the tactics and about the therapy. Uh, we used uh, uh, antibiotic therapy with clindamycin and meropenem. Uh, in this patient, also we used some hyperbaric uh, uh, oxygenation. Some hyperbaric oxygenation uh, and uh, uh, some other intensive therapy to try to save his life. Next day, uh, наступного дня була виконана повторна хірургічна обробка рани з додатковим висвіченням некротичних тканин. Next day, we... таку хірургічну обробку ми повторяли ще кілька разів. Next day, we take him to OR again and make some debridement again. And this we do a few more times with excising of all the tissues. Complex лікування хірургічного і інтенсивної терапії дозволив зберегти життя цьому молодому чоловіку і отримати рану локалізувати інфекцію, усунути інфекцію, подальшому рану закрити спочатку ксенотрансплантатами і потім виконати пластику торакодорозальним м'язовим клаптем ділянки плечового суглобу і ділянки плеча. А A combination of the active surgical tactic and uh, IV uh, intensive therapy uh, give a chance to save uh, the life of this patient. Uh, later, we uh, close uh, these wounds uh, firstly with uh, xenografts and then uh, make the uh, latissimus dorsi transposition transfer to close these wounds and then make a skin graft over the mask. Отримали такий найближчий результат. And uh, this is the early result of uh, the treatment. Пацієнт живий, віддалений результат є кращий, але вибачте, не маю слайда, щоб вам його представити. The patient is alive. Uh, we already have a delayed uh, late result, but uh, we don't have uh, the photo of this patient. Sorry for this. Uh, but the main thing that the patient is alive and uh, we could save his hand. 
and his life. Лікування таких пацієнтів із тяжкими формами некритизуючої інфекції вимагає мультидисциплінарного підходу, але найперше це є настороженість хірургів до того, що потрібно основним у лікуванні є рання, активна і радикальна хірургічна тактика. Uh, the treatment of such kind of uh, infection is uh, very hard uh, and uh, it needs a multidisciplinary uh, approach to treat this kind of patient. But uh, most of all, uh, we should remember about, about this kind of infection and uh, uh, know about this kind of infection and uh, have in mind that uh, it can occur and uh, the main uh, thing that we should apply uh, is the early uh, surgical intervention to treat this patient. І у підсумку хотілося б наголосити, що в діагностиці поширення процесу гнійно-некротичного важливіше значення має не гіперемія, не візуальні ознаки а власне поширення болю, болевого синдрому і інтоксикації. Uh, and for our opinion, uh, the main uh, signs uh, of uh, uh, this infection, the, of uh, spread of this infection is not a hyperomy, uh, but the pain and uh, intoxication. Я вам дякую за увагу і всім бажаю здоров'я, нам перемоги і мати менше таких тяжких пацієнтів. Всім дякую. Thank you for attention and uh, wish you good luck and the earlier victory to us. Okay. So, Dean, maybe Thank you very much. Sure. Maybe you have some comments or Christian about these cases presented by uh, Professor Tuchak. Yeah, I'd be, yes. I'd be interested to, to know what the organism was in the, the young chap with the thigh wound. Um, was it a clostridia or was it a, um, a, a type one or um, the, an aggressive in, infection? The last case? No, the, the young man with the thigh wound. Um, ah. And also, I think that you know the, the case, the last case you presented was was a difficult one because you've got multiple muscles, you've got multiple multiple tissue planes, uh, and it's often difficult then to, to to decide on the extent of your debridement. Um, uh, and I think that sometimes when you when you get uh, necrotic disease over over vascular structures over nerves, it's an often difficult decision yes. whether to uh, excise them or not. Um, Personally, I, 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 I tend to give them the benefit of the doubt initially, and I'll, I'll perhaps strip the oven tissue, send that for, for gram stain, um, but I, 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 and, I, and I'll, I'll, I'll leave them. To, but if, this, if the patient is not improving, then I'll, I'll, I won't hesitate to take them at that point. Um, and I'm interested to know um, Christian's take on that, really. Uh, okay. Oh, yes, no, no. Can I understand uh, you? Uh, yes, I watch uh, and nerve and vessels, and uh, this debridement, yes, was very, very complicated. Um, I must uh, excision muscles because uh, it was uh, necrotized muscles and necrotized. Um, um, tissue and lymphatic uh, lymphatic system was necrotized. It was um, the main infection, main intoxication, uh, uh, necrotizing tissue. I think you're absolutely right. If the tissue's dead, it's just got to go. Um, and I think often when you do an adequate debridement, then the patient systemically gets a lot better quite quickly after your debridement when that sort of toxic load has been taken away. Um, 
but yeah, difficult, difficult cases, really difficult cases, you know, and, um, yes, you're right. My, you're right. My, my, you know, my, my heart goes out to you in, in treating these patients. Uh, right. Uh -huh. Ігор Романович, Дін також питає з приводу флори у молодого чоловіка, в якого була рана на стегні, той, що, на жаль, загинув. Флора, яка була в нього? Не пов'язку. Так, так. Дякую дуже за ці питання. Тут був анаеробік і аеробік. Uh, mm, bacterium, mm, more anaerobic bacterium. Clostridium? Yes, clostridium, neclostridium and clostridium. Okay. And, and I think it, those sort of injuries sort of end themselves to, to spore, you know, when you've got necrotic what? tissue, when, you, when you've got um, altered blood vessels, you've got, you know, ischemic tissue that sort of lends itself to that sort of clostridia. Uh, Clostridium infection, and, and I think, and you know, obviously, that's unique to these sort of injuries that you're seeing um, uh, from gunshot wounds, traumatic crush, crush injuries, and that sort of stuff. And, and the the blast effects lead is, to um, contamination with uh, with earth, which is a problem. Yes, and, and also yes. the blast wave. Uh, can damage the tissue more and that tissue is a substrate for all these microorganisms to... When we have uh, uh, ischemic tissue, uh, anaerobic infection, it's a very, very uh, quickly, um, very quickly intoxication. Yeah. Right, well, I think we're coming towards the end of our allotted time. So, uh, Professor, thank you for the, sharing those cases, terrible yeah. cases, uh, but two lives saved. So uh, yes. that, that's always important. Um, uh, I think uh, just to uh, summarize really what we've learned about managing infection over the last uh, several weeks, uh, I think early aggressive debridement is important. It's particularly important in combat injuries and it's particularly important in blast injuries. Yes. You should try to remove all dead uh, and foreign material apart from maybe very small fragments of, of shrapnel. It is worth, if you have the facilities, taking specimens for microbiology and certainly that's the, been the British uh, uh, military experience. Uh, copious low pressure washout but avoid pulse lavage and never close wounds. Um, a second look uh, with resampling, probably at about 48 hours, depending on the condition. Uh, in sick patients, you must monitor them regularly with their physiology, blood tests, look at the wounds, and also keep checking the microbiology because there may be things, organisms that you don't normally treat, particularly antifungals. Um, vac dressings may be helpful later in terms of managing dead space um, and uh, reducing exudate. Soft tissue cover when safe. Uh, and I think in sick patients, it's clear that uh, you should consider necrotizing fasciitis, where the treatment is early surgical exploration, uh, looking for the dishwater fluid and the sweep test uh, you must monitor the blood tests, start early uh, antibiotics, including a, a broad spectrum penicillin, clindamycin. And these patients are likely to get very sick and need to be uh, supported on intensive care. They're likely to have massive fluid losses uh, and need close monitoring, including a catheter to make sure that you're keeping the hydration up to date. Uh, so hopefully that summarizes some of the take home messages from today's excellent session uh, and previous uh, webinars. Um, we won't be having a, a webinar next week, but we have an open session on Tuesday afternoon, early evening for you uh, at the IFSSH meeting. 
Um, and we will be resuming the webinars after that, but probably not every week, perhaps once a fortnight. Um, so uh, I'm very grateful to the speakers this evening and to all the speakers we've had in the last 10 weeks. Um, it's been a, a, a privilege to, uh, to, to share your experiences with you in Ukraine. Uh, and we're, we're grateful to you for giving us the opportunity and very humbled by what you've achieved in terrible circumstances. We all hope that this madness comes to an end soon, um, but even if it does, there's doubtless going to be a huge burden of injured patients who will need treatment over many months and years to come. Uh, so thank you very much. Uh, we really hope to see as many of you as possible a week on Tuesday and we'll send the links out. Um, and with that, uh, Andre, uh, I leave you to close the meeting. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you, colleagues, for the fact that you were with us. I'll just summarize what we were talking about today and on the previous webinars. The fact that uh, patients with oxygen and minimum травмами мають бути обов'язково е, оглянути мультидисциплінарно, не тільки е, якимось лікарям. Е, має завжди бути мультидисциплінарний підхід, е, завжди е, агресивний е, дебрідмент е, ран є важливим. Е, якщо є можливість взяти е, мікробіологічний посів, то це буде тільки в плюс, тому що ви будете знати, з якою інфекцією ви маєте справу. Ніколи не зашивати рани. А, треба розглядати можливості а, вторинного, а, вторинної хірургічної обробки ран, третинної хірургічної обробки ран а, до а, того, поки рани не будуть повністю чистими. А, після того, як рани будуть чистими, можна розглянути а, питання застосування вак терапії, терапії негативним тиском для зменшення а, розміру дефектів. Проте, Варто пам'ятати, що ВАК – це лише пов'язка, це не метод лікування. І великі дефекти все ж таки варто закривати різноманітними пластичними способами. Обов'язково треба контролювати таких пацієнтів з з точки зору обміну речовин, з точки зору втрати вологи, треба так, щоб у вас в команді обов'язково був досвідчений лікар, анестезіолог, реаніматолог, який міг би допомогти вам в корекції загального стану пацієнта. Треба пам'ятати, що, як правило, такі пацієнти а, можуть мати різноманітні септичні ускладнення. Як правило, дуже важкі а, клінічно пацієнти треба розглядати а, варіант того, що в таких пацієнтів можуть розвинутися такі важкі захворювання, як а, некротизуючий фасцеїд, як сепсис. Обов'язково на це звертати увагу. А, і... Наголошую ще раз, ніколи не зашивати рани наглухо зразу. Профілактика компартмент синдрому, профілактика інфекційного складнення грають роль і дозволяють значно швидше і значно краще досягти успіху у лікуванні таких пацієнтів. Крім того, нагадаю вам, що на наступний четвер у зв'язку з підготовкою до проведення Конгресу ЄФСЕЙЧ вебінару не буде. Через четвер буде в відкритому доступі для всіх бажаючих з України секція на ЄФСЕЙЧ з військової травми. І після цього е, обов'язково розглянемо можливість подальшого проведення подібних вебінарів. Е, скоріше за все, це не будуть щотижневі вебінари, скоріше за все, це буде е, раз на два тижні чи раз на місяць вебінар з приводу окремих тем. 
але е, тим не менш. Е, також е, федерація асоціації хірургів кісті і е, британська е, хірургії кісті е, вдячні, і ми їм дуже вдячні за те, що вони е, поділилися своїм досвідом, е, дали можливість нам е, дізнатися багато нового, багато різних різноманітних tips and tricks з лікування вогнепальної травми, за що ми їм надзвичайно, надзвичайно вдячні. Сподіваємося, що ці вебінари були вам надзвичайно корисні, і я думаю, що ми будемо працювати над тим, щоб продовжувати цю серію в подальшому, проте, можливо, не так часто. Uh, so thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jonathan. Thank you, uh, Andrea, all FESH, all uh, uh, BSSH, and uh, all our uh, panelists, uh, lecturers that uh, take uh, their time and uh, share with us their knowledge, their experience. Uh, thank, also thanks to all our doctors from Ukraine that share uh, their cases. Uh, and uh, thank you very much again. That That's very useful webinar series for us, for Ukrainian uh, doctors. Uh, we uh, hope that nobody in Europe will uh, see such kind of injuries will face such kind of uh, horrible situation like war, but uh, I hope we, we will win soon and we will live in a peaceful and a great Europe, united Europe. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Thank you.